Welcome everybody to another episode of Real Estate Exam Prep where I take down information that's gonna be on the real estate exam and break it down for you so that way you can pass the exam on the first try. Now today's part two of, of a two part session that I have, two part video. Uh, the first part we were talking about uh, land rights, the bundle rights and all that good stuff, right? So now today, we are gonna get into limitations of those rights, right? This is why you can't charge airplanes rent when they, they travel over your property and so forth, okay? So let's get into the limitations. So there's four limitations that we have. We have eminent domain, police powers, a street, and taxation. So what's eminent domain? So eminent domain, is the inherent power of the state to seize a citizen's private property or a citizen's right in property with due monetary compensation, but without the consent of the owner. So what does that mean is that the state can take your property if they can prove it's going to be for the greater good of the community, but they must pay you fair market compensation. All right, so that's eminent domain. Okay, so that's one of the limitations that you have. Um, and you might hear about it in the news. I know here in Worcester, uh, 146, when we had Walmart, they built a Walmart over there. Um, you know, uh, the city of Worcester took some property through eminent domain. Um, I know like Fitchburg, Route 2, same thing. They widened the road. They did that through eminent domain, okay? So that's the first limitation that we have. Now, something about eminent domain that I do want to um, um, make a point of is the process in which they acquire it they condemn the property so it's condemnation okay so you might see that on the exam so condemnation is the process eminent domain is the rule is the law okay um now when you when you hear condemnation don't don't think of it as you know the, the, the property is dilapidated and so forth it's just the process in which they acquire the property now under condemnation we do have something called inverse condemnation so what does that mean well this can happen in a couple different ways so let's say an example is that you have a business, okay? And the town wants to open up a widened street. And in order to do that, they take part of your parking lot. So you have your business, but now you have no parking for your, your customers. You're gonna lose revenue, you're gonna lose business. You're not gonna stay in business. So because the town took your parking lot through eminent domain, they weren't interested in your building, they just needed that space to widen the road, they adversely affected the value of your property. So you can petition to the state and say, well, listen, because of what you've done, you've taken this property through eminent domain, you've adversely affected my property value. So I want you now to buy that property, to buy the rest of the property and pay me fair market value for, for that property because the, the property's not worth anything now because you took all my parking. Okay, so there's, there's a you, you can you, there's a play on that. So you have some recourse um, if they do that, or let's say the state took your neighbor's property, and they you know they decide to put a, um, a highway you know um, off ramp or on ramp you know um, in that space, and that affects your property value. You right next door to it, then you can file for inverse condemnation and petition to have the state take your property because of what they've done has affected your property. So the next limitation we have is police powers. Now, when you hear police powers, don't think of the boys in blue. Like, like it took me forever to kind of get that out of my head. I kept thinking of just police officers. Think of policing as monitoring overseeing, okay? So under police powers, we're gonna have a bunch of limitations there. So some of those are gonna be zoning bylaws, building codes, subdivision regulations, environmental restrictions and development requirements zoning is the means by which cities and counties regulate land use and implement their master plan okay so so when you think of, of a community of a town right they strategically allow certain things to happen in certain parts of that town right think about your house if you live in a single family home and you have like two automotive shops right next to you right 24 you know noise and all that other stuff do you think that's going to increase or reduce the value of your property it's going to reduce it so really when we look at zoning really the whole thing behind everything 
is money, right? We, they want their property taxes, which we're gonna get into taxation. So they wanna make sure that only certain things are happening in certain areas. They're able to, um, you know, work their master plan, have things in, in certain neighborhoods, okay? And, and that's done strategically. So zoning ordinances are gonna be regulation created by the local government, what your city or your town. Um, they will have every parcel of land within the city or the town is gonna to have a specific usage. And that's done by design. So zoning is gonna include four other topics, okay? We have non-conforming use or, or grandfathered, we'll get into that. Uh, we have variances. We also have special exceptions um, or conditional permits. And then we have zoning amendments. So let's talk grandfather status, right? We've heard that term before, grandfather status, but what does that mean? Well, that means that when the property was originally built, and I'm gonna give an example, a three-decker, right? A typical Worcester three-decker is a non-conforming property. What does that mean? Well, that means that when that property was built way back when, 1890, 1910, whatever it is, it met the current zoning for that area. It was legal to build three-deckers, okay? Now that's changed. You can't build a three-decker anymore. And I'm sure some of you are wondering why. Well, yeah, you know, this three-decker burned down. How come they don't rebuild it? Because it doesn't meet the current zoning laws, right? And part of that is because when they build the three-deckers, there was no firewall in between. So if there was a fire, it would just travel to the other units. So they just deemed it as it's an illegal structure. Now, it's non-conforming, meaning that if the building is still there now, if you buy a three-decker, which well, I'm selling them, right? Um, if you if you buy a three-decker now, five, six hundred thousand dollars, they still have value. As long as the property is still there, then it's fine. You can keep it. You don't have to change it or comply with the new zoning laws. But if something major happens to that property, if that property burns down or, or a more than a certain percentage of it you know, burns down um, or if there's structural issues, then you may have to bring it to current zoning law and, or that code and you may not be able to have that three-decker anymore. So non-conforming was is that it was conforming at one point, the zoning laws changed and as long as the building is still there, you can keep it and still utilize that property as it was. Now what's a variance? So a variance is you want to use your piece of property for something other than what's specified for that area, right? And sometimes it can be um, a big thing that you want to change or something could be very small. So for instance, let's say you want to build an in-law unit on your property, but the, but the zoning for your area doesn't allow for in-law. So you want a variance. You're asking for permission with the zoning board and saying, hey, I know that's not part of the zoning, but we want, we want to use it. We want it, We want special permission in order to do that. Will you allow me a variance? And you'll apply. Um, commonly where we see the variance now is are gonna be like in lots where people are trying to build a lot, but maybe you don't have enough frontage um, that's required under zoning. Maybe zoning says you need 100 feet and you only have 90 feet, right? Technically, well, you can't build. You don't, you don't fit under the current criteria to build uh, as far as the zoning. Well, if you ask for a variance, then they'll look at it and say, okay, you know, like we can see it's only 10 feet, you know, we'll allow it. It's not gonna create a, a you know, a disturbance in the neighborhood, whatever it is. So that's a variance. So now a special exception when it comes to zoning is a little bit different. That's really gonna be more for like public use or like 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 um, a government use or, or authority use. Um, think of like a fire station, right? There is no zoning for fire stations. Like there's no particular area that says, this area here is zoned for just fire stations. No, it's either residential, commercial, mixed use, whatever it is. But they wanna put a fire station or a police station here. So here you would get a special exception. It'll be granted to them so that way they can build something that doesn't meet what the, what, you know, what the zoning is for that area. But typically it's gonna be reserved for, uh, for government authorities or some, some sort of an authority type use. The last one we have is a zoning amendment, okay? And what a zoning amendment is, is that you're asking for the board to allow, to allow a, a, a particular use um, of a property that it's not zoned for, right? So, so for instance, um, let's say you wanna open up a dentist office in your property, right? It's large enough and you have a, another, you know, uh, maybe your first floor, you wanna make that into a practice. Well, your neighborhood might be just residentially zoned. 
Um, so now you need mixed use because now you're gonna be operating a business. So you're gonna have commercial on one floor and you're gonna have residential on another floor. So you're applying for that mixed use. So the zoning amendment's gonna be, can you just change the zoning for my lot and not the neighborhood so I can do what I wanna do? And that's a zoning amendment. So earlier I mentioned why you can't charge airplanes rent when they go over your property. It has to do with zoning. Because zoning is also gonna specify how much of your airspace you can actually utilize. After a certain point, you don't own it anymore or you don't have the right um, to do anything, you know, or, or you know, that it, it doesn't belong to anymore. Um, the government actually owns the airspace once you get to a certain distance. So depending on where you live, your air rights are gonna be limited. So that's why you can't charge them rent. Same thing as far as digging, the zoning is going to, to limit that as well. So still continuing with police powers, we now have building codes. Now building codes are gonna help protect the public against unregulated construction. They also set the standards for any kind of, of building um, in the area, right? The type of materials that you're gonna utilize and so forth. Um, the code department or building code department, they are the ones that issue occupancy certificates. And that's very important because without an occupancy certificate, even though you might've built a house and it's beautiful, without that certificate, as, as far as the city, that property is not suitable for human occupancy. So it's important that you do everything up to code and it's done, it's there to protect, um, to protect the public and make sure that things are done correctly. So if somebody moves in, the house doesn't just fall apart. So they're also gonna get into building support systems. So electrical, plumbing, um, you know, uh, whether or not you need sprinklers and so forth, that's gonna be all encompassed under building codes. So our third limitation is gonna be taxation. And we already know about taxes, right? So this is how towns and cities are able to pay for public services. So for police officers, teachers, firefighters, um, you know, fixing potholes and things like that, um, part of that money comes from property value, right? They, 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 they tax the properties of, of the communities and that's how they're able to, um, you know, to maintain that budget. Now, property taxes are based on assessed value, not market value. And the difference is market value is pretty much what a ready, willing and able buyer is willing to pay for your property on the open market, okay? Usually market value is higher than the assessed value. Assess value, the town has an algorithm, a system they come up with. They look at, you know, your property, how old it is, have you done any repairs to it? And they come up with a valuation. It includes the land, it includes the structure, okay? And they're gonna tax you on that. Um, it's gonna be ad valerum. Ad valerum is Latin for according to value, but it's going to be according to assess value, not true market value. So the way it works is that you are gonna be charged a millage rate. Okay, think of the millage rate as a dollar amount. Okay, I think Worcester right now, we're at $19.31 as our millage rate. Now, I'm gonna be charged $19.31 per every thousand dollars of assessed value. So for instance, if my property is worth 350,000, that's my assessed value, right? Not worth, but my assessed value with the town is 350,000, and that's just say market value is 400,000. I'm paying taxes on the $350,000 assessment. So the way it works is I'm gonna pay $19.31 per thousand of assessed value. So how many thousands go into 350,000? 350. So you take your 19, 1931 and you multiply it by 350 and that's gonna give me what my yearly tax rate is gonna be for that particular property. And typically they charge you quarterly and that's how, you, that's how you're gonna pay out. So that's how it is. Remember, you pay on assessed value, it's per thousand dollars of assessed value and your dollar amount is gonna be your millage rate. Now, the last limitation we're gonna go over is a sheet, okay? Now, a sheet is, it's the town's inherent power to pretty much take your property if you die without a will. Because if you die without a will, that means there's no one to take over that property, right? If there's no one to take over that property, who's paying the property taxes on it? That's really what the town cares about. They don't want your property. They want the tax money coming in, okay? So, in essence, According to the town, if you die without a will, you've abandoned the property. 
So if you've abandoned it, we need somebody to claim it, right? So they can actually take your property and auction it. Now, when you die, when you die without a will, there's a term for that and it's called intestate. So if you die intestate, that means that you died without a will. If you die testate, well, you died with the will and you're all set. Your property's not abandoned. It's, it, you know, either you willed it to someone or somebody's going to take over. Uh, now, typically, you know, in real life, the town will try to look for a next of kin and so forth. But if they don't find anybody, they have the right to take it and then sell the property at auction just so they can get that tax money coming in. Well, there you have it, folks. Those are your four limitations to land rights and the bundle of rights. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. I will certainly get back to you. Um, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. If you're thinking about getting your license and you haven't started yet, please check us out, championrealestateacademy.com. We have classes every month. Well, guys, thank you, and I hope to see you in class.